Most people assume that low back pain comes from the disc, but that's not always true. I've seen a lot of patients who were referred to me for back pain and they were getting treated for discogenic pain for years. And unfortunately they were still in pain. In fact, only 30 to 40% of back pain is actually caused by discogenic pain. And it's very important to know what the other pain generators are. Because if you're assuming that your pain is coming from the disc, or if your doctor is assuming that your pain is coming from the disc, then ultimately you can go down the rabbit hole of wrong treatments. So it's important to understand the anatomy and understand the different patterns of back pain. For those who are new to the channel, my name is Dr. Sater. I am a double bordered pain doctor and neurologist. And in this video, I will explain what the top three most common pain generators are so that you have a better understanding of where your pain might be coming from so you can better discuss that with your provider. So first, let's start with discogenic pain so that we can have a better understanding of what it is and what it's not. So pain coming from the disc. So this right here is the intervertebral disc between two vertebrae and the lumbar spine. And essentially, discogenic pain, when it's coming from the disc itself, tends to worsen upon flexion of the spine. So anytime that you are flexing, so for example, sitting, bending over, that would be a flexion of the spine. And that, as you can see over here in this model, increases the pressure on the disc itself. For some people say as much as 400% increase in pressure when you are sitting. So that kind of pain that horses with flexion is classic for discogenic pain. And it can either be in the back itself, exclusively in the back, or it can actually radiate down the legs. That's what we call radicular pain. If the disc herniation gets bigger, then ultimately it will start compressing the nerve root close to it. And that's what leads to radicular pain shooting down the leg. Okay, so let's move on to the second type of pain, which is facet pain. So the facet joint is really the connection between one vertebra and the one above it and below it. So you can see them right here. You have one on the right, one on the left. And these joints are essential to allow us to move our spine. So whenever you're flexing and extending your spine, you need to have movement at the uh, facet joint. And with arthritis and wear and tear, ultimately, uh, those facet joints develop hypertrophy and uh, become their own pain generator. And that kind of pain has pretty much the opposite pattern than discogenic pain, in the sense that this kind of pain is worse when people are extending their spine. So most often when they are standing for a long period of time or walking and gets better when they are sitting or flexing their spine. And the pain itself is often localized in the back as a dull stiffness. So a lot of patients describe it as, you know, they feel that their back is very stiff, but a lot of times it can lead to referred pattern. So these facet joints actually have a referral pattern that is sometimes in the legs. So that can be in the thighs. It's not really the same as the classic radicular pain that you see with the uh, nerve root involvement. It's really more of a diffuse referred pain. Now, if the facet hypertrophy gets large enough that it's actually leading to impingement of the nerve around it, then that is what we call spinal stenosis. And that can lead to patterns of leg heaviness and numbness and weakness when patients are walking for a long period of time. Okay, now the third most common type of low back pain that I see is sacroiliac joint pain. So the sacroiliac joint is the connection between the sacrum and the pelvis. Let's use a different model. All right, so this model is a little bit better for showing that. So the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint, is the connection between the sacrum and the pelvis. So you see it right here. You have one on the right, one on the left. And this joint is prone to either inflammation in certain patients or potentially arthritis and degenerative changes in other patients and leads to pain in the very low back and upper buttock region. Now, with the sacroiliac joint, it tends to be a pain generator in patients who either have had a previous fusion surgery because now the pressure and the stress on the spine has to go below the fusion. So that tends to be the sacroiliac joint. However, for other patients, it could be because they have a rheumatological condition and that can lead to sacroiliitis, which is inflammation of the SI joint. So these are sort of the two most common types of risk factors. To summarize, pain coming from the disc, what we call discogenic pain, tends to worsen upon flexion of the spine. So if you're sitting or bending over, it can be in the back itself, if it's only the disc, or if it's involving the nerve roots, then it can potentially be shooting down the legs. However, uh, this kind of pain usually improves if you are extending your back. 
So for example, walking can potentially make it better or standing. The second type of pain that we discussed was facet pain. And with that kind of pain, essentially it's the opposite pattern. It worsens when you are standing or when you are walking and it improves if you are sitting. And with that kind of pain, it can also be either in the back itself or it can lead to a referral pattern around it. So in the thigh can be a refer pain or potentially if the arthritis gets worse, then it can compress the nerves around it and lead to what we call spinal stenosis. And that one will involve the legs. That's what we refer to as neurogenic claudication and patients feel it when they are walking and they feel that they have heaviness and numbness potentially or weakness in their leg. Finally, the third type of pain was the sacroiliac joint pain, which is um, in the low back upper buttock region that tends to happen when patients are sitting. Most often they feel it because you're sitting when you're SI joint. And if somebody has a history of a previous fusion surgery in their low back, or if they have a history of a rheumatological condition. The treatment for all these is very different. If you have a discogenic pain, then the target is going to be the disc itself and the epidural space. So a lot of times for those, we would do an epidural, either interlaminal or a transforaminal epidural. If your pain is coming from the facet joints, then we are going to target the facet joint itself, usually the medial branch that is innervating it. And that's amenable to a procedure called radiofrequency ablation, or FA, where we essentially burn that part of the nerve that is innervating the joint. And by denervating it, we are removing the pain signal that goes to the brain. And that tends to help patients a lot. And if the sacroiliac joint is your pain generator, then an injection in the SI joint itself uh, can potentially be the treatment. Generally speaking, the treatment for low back pain is a spectrum. So you start initially with more conservative management like physical therapy, and then you progress to trying medications that can include nerve medications and muscle relaxants, anti-inflammatories sometimes. And then you have interventional treatment. So that is procedures like epidural steroid injections, um, as well as radiofrequency ablations, nerve blocks. And if injections don't work, then surgery would be the next and final step. And that can include microdiscectomies, laminectomies, fusions, and other surgeries. I hope that you found this video useful. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Tell me which type of pain you think you have based on this information. Check out this video right here to learn more about these muscle knots and trigger point injections, which will help with the muscular component that is often overlying a lot of these low back pain generators. All right, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and I will see you in the next video.